Abuse in America. The Holy Father meets a delegation from the U.S. to discuss clergy misconduct. Lauren Ashburn is in Rome, bringing us the latest. Stormy weather. Hurricane Florence closes in on the Carolinas. This is going to be one of the biggest ones to ever hit our country. Why the White House believes it is ready to help. Democrats delay. New details in the confirmation process for Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh, a lifelong Catholic. No! And up to speed. Olympic champion sprinter Usain Bolt's most recent victory leaves him floating on air. On EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, September 13th, 2018. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you for joining us for News from a Catholic Perspective. I'm Wyatt Goolsby. Stunning news out of the Vatican tonight as Pope Francis accepts the resignation of a 75-year-old West Virginia bishop who was accused of sexually harassing adults. It happened at the same time the head of the U.S. bishops met with Pope Francis. Lauren Ashburn is reporting from the Vatican this week on multiple investigations into clergy sex abuse. Lauren, tell us what you know about the Pope's investigation into Bishop Michael Bransfield. Wyatt, not only has he accepted Bransfield's resignation, but the Vatican announced it is authorizing Archbishop William Lorry of Baltimore to investigate the allegations. The resignation was announced just as a four-member U.S. delegation was sitting down with Pope Francis in his private study in the Apostolic Palace. Now, in addition to U.S. Bishops Conference President DiNardo was Cardinal Sean O'Malley, Archbishop Jose Gomez, and Bransfield's relative, Monsignor Brian Bransfield, Secretary General of the Bishops Conference. Lori has been named what's called Apostolic Administrator or Overseer of Bishop Bransfield's Diocese of Wheeling, Charleston, while a new bishop is being chosen, Lori has set up a hotline for potential victims to call and is vowing to conduct a thorough investigation. Bransfield has denied the allegations and termed them horrific. Now, he turned 75 this month, and canon law, as you know, states that that's the age when bishops and cardinals have to tender their resignation to the pope. Analysts here tell us it is rare that the Pope accepts a resignation this fast. In fact, it can take years, as in the case of Cardinal Donald Wuerl of the Archdiocese of Washington. Now, the Vatican has only released video and pictures of the meeting. However, Cardinal DiNardo says he is grateful to the Holy Father for receiving them and says he updated Pope Francis on the U.S. crisis, quote, saying he listened very deeply from the heart. It was lengthy and a fruitful and good exchange, and he looks forward to working with the Pope to discern together the most effective steps forward. Lauren, just last night, reports from the Associated Press came out saying a priest in Cardinal DiNardo's diocese had been arrested, and two people accused Cardinal DiNardo of not doing enough to stop that priest. What are the details there? It was quite a bit of news to wake up to this morning here at the Vatican. Now, here are the allegations against Father Manuel La Rosa Lopez. They were made by two people who told the Associated Press they were fondled as teenagers and subsequently reported the priest and met with Cardinal DiNardo about it. One of them says she was promised by DiNardo that the priest would be removed from any contact with children. But La Rosa Lopez was allegedly kept in active ministry at another parish 70 miles away. So Wyatt, although the statute of limitations might not allow these cases to be prosecuted, this arrest casts a shadow over Cardinal DiNardo. Abuse survivors say Cardinal DiNardo needs to come clean. Wyatt, it is an unbelievable amount of information here to process in Rome. And joining me now to help make sense of it all is a Vatican Insider, I guess we could say. You've worked here for the 18 years that you have been in Rome, Monsignor Anthony Figueredo. Tell me, to what extent does the church understand the impact that all of these allegations are having worldwide? Crescendo of allegations, uh, Lauren. Every day something new comes out. We've had ex-Cardinal McCarrick. We've had the Pennsylvania grand jury report. Thousands of cases yesterday in Germany and today Bishop Bransfield. 
Is the Holy See getting this message? Yes, certainly Pope Francis. He's called the head of every Episcopal conference to meet with him in February. He's met the heads of the Conference of Bishops in the United States. He's written that letter to the people of God where he talks about the heart-wrenching pains that cry out to heaven, silenced, ignored. And so the Holy Father now wants bishops to get exactly the same message. Well, I understand that you met with the Pope over the weekend. I did privately. The Holy Father called me. I met with him for over one hour, and the Holy Father is suffering greatly. He's gathering information, so he wants the Vatican now to act upon that. Well, we've heard this all before, I'm sorry to say, and I think many of the viewers would agree with this. We had a sex abuse crisis in 2002. These cases now are dwarfing, uh, dwarf those uh, that happened. I, I can't understand how the faithful are supposed to believe in the church right now. You're absolutely right, Lauren. The fox cannot guard the hen house, the chicken coop. Bishops cannot investigate bishops. That is what is new at this moment. And what is really important, you know, we had Mary Collins, this ex-survivor of abuse, who called for a tribunal, independent, which was ignored, rejected. But that's exactly what we need, because at the moment, canon law protects the abuser more than the abuse. What Mary Collins says is we need a change in canon law. And in fact, this week, over 200 new bishops heard Marie Collins' testimony, and many of them said this is the most important and urgent thing we have heard all week. That is good news that that message made it to the bishops. Let's turn now to the Papal Foundation. Uh, you know a lot about the Papal Foundation. It is based in the United States. It gathers money. It sends it to the Holy Father. But the chairman is Cardinal Donald Wuerl. What is going to happen to the Papal Foundation? Well, it's a stellar organization, gives millions to the Holy Father for his charitable activities every year. And I'm hearing from members, one who wrote to me and said today, I'm really angry. But, you know, in moments of great crisis, there's also great grace. And faithful, good Catholics, as in the Papal Foundation, are saying, we need accountability. We need a new beginning. Thank you so much for joining us and helping us to make sense out of all of these allegations, everything that's happening in the Vatican. Monsignor Anthony Figueredo, thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Wyatt, we are now going to turn it back over to you in Washington, where I know that you have more information about the Papal Foundation. Our reporter, Juliet Lindley, was out gathering some of that information today here in Rome. Wyatt, back to you. Lauren Ashburn reporting from Rome. Thanks, Lauren. Vatican Secretary of State Cardinal Pietro Parolin refused to answer questions by our correspondent Juliet Lindley on whether a Vatican probe into sex abuse should be launched. The question is about the Papal Foundation. Now, the treasurer is asking that the president and chairman. Ah, but they are step not, we are not speaking about this question or other question I am not going to answer. Can we ask you about an investigation on whether the Vatican should no, create no, no, an investigation no, nothing, on the sex nothing abuse about, crisis? Uh, no, it's not time for me to answer uh, this Let's, question. Cardinal Paroline was speaking at a Vatican conference on the humanitarian crisis in Iraq and Syria. Meanwhile, the Vatican is opening an investigation into allegations of corruption by the directors of the Sistine Chapel Choir. A Vatican press statement yesterday confirmed that Pope Francis had authorized the probe a few months ago. The ongoing investigation concerns an Italian bank account allegedly opened by the two choir directors and used to pay personal expenses. Back in the United States, wind and rain are hitting the East Coast as Hurricane Florence comes ashore. President Trump will remain in Washington to lead the government's response to the storm. He's also fighting back against allegations that he mishandled another natural disaster. White House correspondent Mark Irons reports. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Wyatt. Florence is swirling now, and even though Hurricane Maria hit last year, it's still causing ripple effects, at least politically. Today, President Trump rejected the conclusion that Maria and another storm killed thousands of people in Puerto Rico. 
The president tweeted, 3,000 people did not die in the two hurricanes that hit Puerto Rico. When I left the island after the storm had hit, they had anywhere from 6 to 18 deaths. As time went by, it did not go up by much. Then, a long time later, they started to report really large numbers like 3,000. He added, this was done by the Democrats in order to make me look as bad as possible when I was successfully raising billions of dollars to help rebuild Puerto Rico. If a person died for any reason, like old age, just add them onto the list. Bad politics. I love Puerto Rico. My job as, as a governor is to state what the facts are. Puerto Rico's governor raised the death toll to 2,975 last month after an independent study found the number of victims in the aftermath of Maria had been severely undercounted. And as Florence approached the Carolinas, President Trump warned that it could be one of the biggest to ever hit our country. Protection of life is the absolute highest priority, and that's what we're doing. It's called protection of life. So God bless everybody and be careful. Even if Florence weakens, it could still be deadly. Forecasters predict a massive storm surge along the Atlantic coast and up to 40 inches of rain. Millions of people are affected. President Trump says safety is his highest priority and he's sparing no expense. He already declared disasters in North Carolina, South Carolina and Virginia. And the White House says 4,000 federal workers are assigned to provide support. Wyatt. Mark, how are Catholic groups planning to respond to Florence? Well, Catholic Charities USA has its national headquarters just outside of Washington here, but it has affiliate locations all over the country, including along the East Coast. Catholic Charities says it is standing by, ready to provide aid to those affected. Wyatt. And I'm sure they will. White House correspondent Mark Irons reporting. Thanks, Mark. Officials in the Philippines evacuate thousands of people as a huge typhoon draws closer. The storm struck Guam earlier this week. It destroyed houses and left hundreds of people displaced. Around 80 percent of the U.S. territory was without power. The typhoon hit the island with winds of 125 miles per hour. After the Philippines, it is on track to hit Hong Kong and China. Israeli forces removed five shacks set up by Palestinians near the West Bank. Activists put up the huts to protest a plan to demolish a nearby neighborhood. Israel says the area was built illegally. It has offered to resettle residents. Nine police officers in Panama are injured after class clashes yesterday with indigenous groups. The demonstrators were armed with pieces of wood and rocks. They're demanding the government build a 14-mile highway in the western part of the country. They say there is currently no infrastructure there. Panama is 85 percent Catholic. There is a lot more ahead on EWTN News Nightly. Coming up, the latest developments in the confirmation process for Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh. And Planned Parenthood announces its new president. Welcome back. I'm Wyatt Goolsby, in for Lauren Ashburn. The Senate Judiciary Committee delays voting on Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh, but Democrats failed to subpoena unreleased documents related to his work in the George W. Bush White House. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi reports. Good evening, Jason. Good evening, Wyatt. Democrats demand those documents, they say, to fully vet Brett Kavanaugh. Some are deemed confidential for the committee only to look at, Democrats are criticizing Republicans for not asking for the documents from Kavanaugh's time as President Bush's staff secretary. I don't understand the rush to judgment. I really do not. We have just 7 percent of this man's records as it, it, on his participation within the White House. Many of us have questions. After last week's hearing, senators from the Judiciary Committee had more questions for the nominee. The very first one had to do with the Obama administration's contraceptive mandate. Last week, Kavanaugh was asked why he sided with the group Priests for Life and its challenge of the rule. Here, take a listen. It was a technical matter of filling out a form. In that case, with that, they said filling out the form would make them complicit in the provision of uh, the uh, abortion-inducing drugs that they were, as a religious matter, objected to. 
Democrats like former presidential candidate Hillary Clinton and Senator Dianne Feinstein joined NARAL in blasting Kavanaugh for that response. They say the 53-year-old judge believes birth control is an abortion-inducing drug. Kavanaugh says he was not expressing an opinion that certain drugs cause abortion. He was only stating the view of priests for life. Now, Judge Kavanaugh submitted a 263-page response to the senator's follow-up questions. In it, he says he would have shaken the hand of a school shooting victim's father. A photo that went viral shows the judge at his hearing turning away from Fred Guttenberg. Kavanaugh says he thought that man was a protester. Wyatt? Okay, Jason, so noting all of this, what are now the chances of the Supreme Court nominees' uh, chances are being confirmed? Pretty good. Uh, now, first, the Judiciary Committee will vote on his nomination next Thursday. Then the full Senate has its turn. Republicans control 51 seats, so he can be confirmed with just GOP support. They hope he'll take his seat on the high court by the beginning of the term, Wyatt, in August, uh, in October. Excuse October. me, October. Okay, Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvey reporting. Thanks, Jason. CBS News has fired one of its top executives. Jeff Fager, executive producer of 60 Minutes, lost his job over a threatening text message to a co-worker. She was investigating reports Fager groped women at parties and permitted an abusive workplace. Fager is the third major figure at CBS to be fired over alleged misconduct. Joining me now is Amber Athey, media and breaking news editor for The Daily Caller. Amber, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. In a statement Jeff Fager said, I want to quote it here, one such note should not result in termination after 36 years, but it did. What does it say about the culture at CBS that he thinks that seeing this text message would be appropriate? for any reason. It's certainly problematic. And when I first heard his response before the text message actually came out, my first thought was, it sounds like he's trying to downplay what he actually did here. He said his words were harsh. They were more than just harsh. He was essentially threatening this reporter with her job. The text message said, you need to, quote, be careful when investigating these allegations against me. And this is someone who is an executive producer at 60 Minutes for uh, basically over a decade telling a, a lower level reporter that she needs to be careful when investigating him. And so for that to come across as anything other than intimidation or threatening mm -hmm. is just ridiculous. And for him to downplay that and suggest that he didn't do anything wrong just shows how entrenched uh, a lot of these men feel about the misconduct they've been able to, to permit at their own networks. Fager's departure, of course, follows the resignation this weekend of CBS chief Les Moonves after accusations uh, by a dozen women of sexual misconduct. And Moonves could receive more than $100 million in severance if an investigation finds his abuses to uh, allegations to be unsubstantiated. But what message do you think that sends to women who, comes, who come forward at CBS and to victims in general? The whole idea that this person could essentially be rewarded mm -hmm. For having these allegations come against him, he gets to take an early retirement. He racks up millions of dollars in severance pay. He's not going to face any charges because all of the statutes of limitations have passed. We're looking at a person who was accused by a dozen women of not only sexual harassment, but sexual assault. Those are very serious accusations. For it to be even be a question of him possibly receiving money from the board at this point, I think just shows that CBS is more interesting more interested in covering up abuse than they are in bringing it to light and making sure that those people are held accountable. Now, CBS has said it would deduct $20 million from any severance <laughs> he would receive and donate it to organizations like the <laughs> Me Too movement. But uh, is that going to help in sort of rehabilitating CBS's image? <laughs> no. I mean, if they were to give $20 million to charity, then they're basically saying that they're still giving $80 million to Moonves, a person who, again, was accused of a dozen women of sexual harassment and sexual assault. You have to look at the fact that they've had Charlie Rose, mm -hmm. Les Moonves, their CEO, who would, had been there for two decades, and now Jeff Fager, three high-profile people at the network in a row. For them to say that a donation is going to clear their name, it simply doesn't add up. Let me follow up with that, because Moonves has been the entertainment division, the president, uh, since 1995. Jeff Fager was only the second person to head 60 Minutes 50 years, in its 50-year history. Does this type of entrenched leadership, people who have been around for so long, lead to this corporate culture, do you think, that's ripe with abuse? N not necessarily. I think there's, there's something to be said for if you're doing a good job at the network, and you are there for a really long, a really long time. That doesn't necessarily mean, of course, that you're going to abuse that power. But the problem is that some of these people are so powerful that when you have people like, in Jeff Fager's case, an intern accused him of groping her at a party. 
who is the network supposed to believe in that in that case? Mm -hmm. And too many times they immediately side with the person who's accused. And in the CBS case, the board actually was planning on siding 100% with Moonvest. The only reason that they turned on him was that they found out that despite denying the allegations, he was planning on getting one of his accusers a job at the network in order to try to shut her up. So many moral and ethical problems, to say the least. Amber Athey, me media and breaking news editor for The Daily Caller, thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me. There's more to come on our newscast tonight. Up next, why sprinter Usain Bolt took to the air in his latest victory. Welcome back. I'm Wyatt Goolsby in for Lauren Ashburn. Planned Parenthood, the largest U.S. abortion provider, names Dr. Lena Wynn as the new president. Wynn is the first doctor to hold the position in five decades. She was born in China and immigrated to the U.S. when she was eight. She has been Baltimore's health commissioner since 2015. Pro-life group Susan B. Anthony List says the pick is an opportunity to clean up Planned Parenthood's sorry record, adding, the best thing Dr. Wynn could do for Planned Parenthood is to help them live up to their claim of being an authentic women's health care provider. An abortion provider in Louisiana asked a judge to nullify state health regulations regarding abortion clinics. In 2015, officials issued a 20-page revamp of licensing standards. Critics say it makes it easier for clinics to be found in violation and possibly lose their permit. Tonight on Pro-Life Weekly, Senator Chuck Grassley says Democrats in red states should vote to confirm Supreme Court nominee Judge Brett Kavanaugh and ignore Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer. And the way I see it is we're elected by the people of our particular state, Iowa in my case. But wherever else they're elected, either in a red or blue state, they ought to be representing the people of their state. Grassley says Schumer should not be leading the Democratic Party if he can't keep all 49 votes together. You can see Catherine Hadro's interview with Senator Chuck Grassley tonight at 10, 10 p.m. Eastern on EWTN. The bishops of Mexico unveil their plan for fighting the corruption and violence plaguing the country. The proposal includes caring for victims of human trafficking, overseeing migrant shelters, and working with the media to spread messages of peace. The Mexican bishops also say they have met with the country's new president and members of his administration. And finally tonight, Olympic champion Usain Bolt's latest victory left him floating on air, literally. <laughs> the fastest man on earth was putting his speed to the test in zero gravity in a plane above France. The event was sponsored by Mum Champagne. Bolt defeated a French astronaut and a man who designed a bottle of bubbly that can be opened in space. The Olympic champion called the event mind-blowing. And it does look like a lot of fun. Once again, shows us how talented Usain Bolt is. And that concludes our newscast for tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Wyatt Goolsby. We're back tomorrow with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night and God bless.